Welcome back to our True Crime in Ancient Times Week at the Getty Villa. My name is Shelby Brown and I'm happy to be hosting these events. Today we are recording and the talk will be presented both on our website, the College Week website, and on our Getty YouTube channel shortly. Please enter any questions in the Q&A panel and um, we will get to them at the end of this talk. And I would love to transition very quickly to the fun part, which is Ken talking about forgery. So Ken holds degrees in classics and archaeology from Berkeley and Oxford. Before joining the Getty in 2002, he was a professor at Boston University. He has vast um, interests in many time periods and uh, some information about him will go into the chat so that I don't have to list way too many things before he gets to talk. Um, well, two of his interests are the materials and techniques of ancient art and also forgery, very relevant to today. So I'm going to transition right away to Ken and enjoy his talk. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Shelby. Um, hello and welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, wherever you are, whatever time of, of day it is. Um, you know, forgery has been around for a long, long time. It, it's nothing new. And today I want to explore a few examples of both forgery in the past and forgery more recently of the past, although it has to be said that many of the forgeries in the past were also of the past in the past. And that's why I begin with this wonderful object, which was excavated at the ancient Near Eastern site in Babylon. And it's a cruciform inscription uh, written in a very archaic uh, form of cuneiform on, on 12 sides that has complex uh, statements of land grants and privileges uh, according to the text, bestowed on a certain temple, the Shamash temple, by an Akkadian king, uh, Manish Tushu, of the late third millennium BC. This was excavated in a much later context, uh, more than 1500 years later. And when it was really closely analyzed by modern scholars looking at the writing, as well as this bizarre form of uh, uh, of this cross-shaped monument uh, in 346 lines, uh, including such bizarre statements as, this is not a lie, it is indeed the truth. He who will damage this document, let Inki, one of the great gods, fill up his canals with slime. The monument is protesting very heavily about its authenticity and what it does, it wasn't produced as a forgery to sell to someone as an art object, it was a forgery, one of the so-called pious frauds, which were very common in the European Middle Ages as well, to grant historic privileges to a certain class of people to document something that allegedly but didn't take place in the past to give them uh, privileges and, and money. Um, and so what I want to look at today, as I said, is forgeries in the past and of the past but look at different kinds of forgeries. Um, certainly, uh, you know, the uh, motivations are many and we'll talk about them in a minute, but I also wanna think about what forgery is and what forgery isn't. And there's a lot of, not necessarily confusion, but a lot of muddle, I would say, about forgery. And we talk about a lot of terms as if they're equivalents to forgery. Fakes, copies, replicas, reproductions, facsimiles, duplicates, imitations and emulations, all of which are looking like and maybe purporting to be something they aren't. Um, but the main thing about forgery, I think, is that there is an intention to deceive for whatever motivation, and we'll come to that in a minute. Counterfeits and frauds certainly share that with forgeries, counterfeits usually being signatures or, or, or banknotes or coins, frauds of all kinds. But forgery, as the definition in the upper left says, comes from the old French, from the Latin, to fabricate, to forge, to construct, to make something. Uh, but of course, it has come to have a pejorative meaning. 
Now, we don't always know the motivations of who made things. With the uh, cruciform inscription from Babylon, the motivation was rights and privileges and indeed, you know, monies would go to these, these priests by having a false ancient pedigree for their temple and their offices. And money is the main motivation for forgery, but not the only one. Certainly forgers have tried to gain favor, status, or prestige, or privileges, such as the Babylonian forgers. Uh, revenge against someone. Pra forgeries have even been made as practical jokes and that may be gone awry, and then people don't want to admit it. Uh, we also know that forgeries, um, maybe they're not forgeries, but different kinds of texts to borrow authority to purport to be a work by a famous author. In classical antiquity, we have texts that we now have assigned to pseudo-Aristotle. They're not by Aristotle, but they're written in the style of Aristotle. Maybe they purported to be by Aristotle, but maybe they were just somebody writing, trying to take on the mantle of authority that Aristotle had. And we even have a category I would call accidental forgeries, and, and there are more than these too, uh, but these are some of the things I'll talk about today. Uh, we know of many forgeries in antiquity that we don't have. The ancient writers speak about them, and we know, for example, of the skeleton of a baby centaur, not this one you see on the screen, that was brought to the emperor Tiberius in the first century. It was a marvel. And, and this is a slide of a work by the artist uh, William uh, Willers, who has constructed a sort of archaeologically found centaur skeleton. But what was brought to Tiberius uh, was successful for a time and convincing, and this is really important, I think, that forgeries, sometimes they're exact copies of things, passed off as originals. Sometimes they're new inventions, things that no one has ever seen before. But even when they're new inventions, things that no one has seen before, they're also to some degree anticipated, they're expected. Forgeries, the successful ones, they meet expectations. They fit within the mindset of their, uh, the markets they're created for, or you could say the marks they're created for, by forgers, dealers, and, and swindlers. Uh, forgeries, when unrecognized, they very much corrupt the corpus of history. But when recognized, they very effectively serve as indices of the taste of the period in which they were made. We can learn a lot for them because they tell us what any given period was looking for in the past, what they expected to find. Since the Greeks and Romans believed that centaurs really existed, it was logical to think that you could find the skeleton of a baby centaur that had died and been, been buried, and that's what was created and recorded in the ancient texts. And again, we don't have that skeleton, but Willers conveniently uh, played uh, on, on this, this idea. Then we have works that we don't know for sure if they're forgeries or not, because we don't know what the dealers said they were, what the artists were aiming to produce that when they made them, or what the buyers thought they were getting. On the left is a small, uh, exquisite bronze statuette with silver inlays of the goddess Athena or Minerva, if you want to use her Greek or her, her Latin name, standing stiffly in this pose. This very refined bronze is surely something the ancients would have thought of as a Corinthian bronze, a bronze of high quality, of special alloy, of extreme elaboration. We can identify this as a Roman work, and you see we've dated it around 50 BC to AD 25, but it's very much in the style of Greek works of half a millennium earlier. And on the right, I show you a statue in marble, larger, uh, but it has the same stylistic propensities, features. It's fully frontal. You see the very stiff, mannered, zigzag folds. There, there's some naturalism, but there's a lot of pattern that's been imposed. And so this style was very appealing to the Romans. And we know the Romans commissioned work in the ancient style, just as, you know, around Los Angeles, where I live, there are a lot of houses 
that are built to look like Mediterranean villas. They're not Mediterranean villas, but they're desirable. They're made in that style. So we don't know if the artist made this emulating and referencing the ancient Greek works, or the artist made this as an antique and it was sold as an antique. But we know again from the ancient writers of the period whose work survived us, that vast prices were paid by wealthy Romans for genuine Greek antiquities, just like we pay vast prices for Leonardo's and Michelangelo's, uh, but also that um, fake, fake antiquities were produced. But whether this antiquity itself, uh, lovely as it is, was presented as a more ancient work or not, we don't know. So there's some, some gray area though there because of our distance from antiquity. For other cases, speaking of Michelangelo, we know Michelangelo as a young man did produce forgeries. We, Giorgio Vasari and his life of uh, Michelangelo and Vasari knew Michelangelo tells a story that the young Michelangelo sculpted a statue of a Cupid. It's not this one here. This is just to give you something to look at. This is an actual authentic ancient Roman figure of the sleeping Cupid. Michelangelo's Cupid is lost, but he produced this statue and, and he, he, he sold it. And then uh, a couple years later, he learned that it had been resold at a much, much higher price as a genuine antiquity. And he was so angry that he revealed himself as the forger. Uh, because he didn't get the money. So it's not just the money he was after, it was also a matter of pride. And we're told by Vasari that the buyer of that statue then uh, sent it back. So he then ironically deprived himself of a genuine uh, Michelangelo, although what he had wanted was an antiquity. But so this anecdote, I think tellingly uh, reveals to us not only that creative artists of the highest stature at times got involved in the forgery market of falsifying uh, what they were purportedly making, but also just as we know, but we sometimes forget, the Renaissance is the period, the Renaissance, the rebirth of antiquity. Antiquity is what people really wanted, Greek and Roman antiquities. And the young Michelangelo maybe rather than making a statue of, of a saint or of a Florentine a hero or a portrait to try to make some money he made in antiquity because that's what the market wanted. If we had Michelangelo's uh, statue of Cupid, it would be really interesting to see how good it was as a forgery. It, interestingly enough, it hasn't been recognized to this day if it survives somewhere. So maybe it's so good that it's in some collection as a genuine ancient work. We, we don't know. Moving forward, there are other categories that show both the influence of taste, but also different techniques. These two frescoes uh, in now in the Louvre were acquired in Rome in the 17th century by an aristocratic collector shortly after the discovery of Pompeii and Herculaneum, which again, drove a whole new rage and desire for uh, ancient works, particularly wall paintings. And um, these were excavated in the region of Mount Vesuvius around the Bay of Naples in the Kingdom of Naples. And the Kings of Naples kept very strict control of the excavation. Nothing was allowed to be exported except as royal gifts. Yet collectors throughout Europe wanted these things. So there was a very vibrant, uh, eager market for anything coming from Pompeii and Herculaneum, especially paintings. And so uh, clever craftsmen and dealers created objects to satisfy the market. And these paintings in their style are just simply not ancient, although the themes are very ancient. On the left, you see Venus surrounded by cupids. And on the right, you see some festival of people dancing around statues. These are not ancient, but what's really interesting to make them more convincing and also maybe to give cover to a dealer, uh, the surface of these frescoes are modern, but the fragments thereon are actually ancient plaster, which could be found in the ruins of Rome and other sites uh, outside of the Vesuvian region, outside of the Bay of Naples, but just plain 
ancient red plaster walls with the images painted on them. So these are forged paintings, but on a genuine ancient plaster ground. So they fall somewhere in between, I would say. Um, another case I mentioned accidental forgery. The marble head on the left was acquired by the Getty Museum decades ago, purportedly an ancient sculpture, and it was immediately associated with a group of sculptures that had been excavated in Greece at a site called Tegea in the Peloponnesus in southern Greece at a temple of Athena. And we know a lot about this temple because of the excavations there, but again, because ancient writers talk about the sculptures and the sculptor, the famous Scopas. Um, the head, the Getty head, was thought to be, uh, when it was offered to the museum, you know, one of the lost works from that temple. But it turns out that it was a modern work, but it wasn't made as a forgery. It was made, we subsequently learned through research, by uh, an art student who took a cast of one of the heads uh, from Tegea on the right and made himself a copy. And uh, he actually followed the erroneous restoration of the helmet along uh, the visor of the crest. And it disappeared. Uh, and then it came back to light and was mistakenly thought to be original and passed off and, and sold as a purported original until we discovered what it is. So this is what I call an accidental forgery, something that's not made as a forgery. It was made as a copy, as an exercise by an art student, but its history gets lost and replaced. Accidental, when accident, but that can also happen deliberately. So an artist can make something that becomes a forgery in the hand of, of a dealer who might be operating deceitfully, but maybe out of ignorance. So these are uh, different categories. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a very different case. There's no doubt that this is a forgery made falsely. It's a terracotta piece uh, made uh, in the 19th century, soon after many similar pieces were found. And they seemed to European aristocratic audiences to reveal not the idealized figures of large-scale marble sculpture, but everyday life of people in antiquity, and especially women. And they were first found and excavated, they were restored, and when the supply of genuine figures couldn't meet the demand of forgers, uh, of the market, I'm sorry, forgers stepped in to supply for that demand. Uh, this object, uh, made in the uh, 19th century, entered an aristocratic British collection and turns out to be the first antiquity, and I'll put antiquity in, in scare quotes because it's not, that was purchased by J. Paul Getty in 1939. And he purchased it when he was really looking at the contents of this aristocratic British house, and he was bidding on tapestries and furniture, but he saw this object in the catalog. And until recently, it had never been on show at the Getty Museum because it was recognized as a forgery and put in the basement. And it was long thought that Getty, you know, got duped. But research into our own archives revealed the annotated auction catalog for this object, and the annotations are in J. Paul Getty's characteristically scraggle hand, scraggly handwriting. And you can see he's trying to determine, and he did this a lot for other objects he bid on, how much he should pay to, or offer to bid. 10 pounds, 20 pounds, 30 to 40 pounds, he's not sure. And then he puts modern question mark over to the right. And we don't know why he thought this, uh, but it's important because he was trying to figure out how much he should bid, and he wasn't sure of the authenticity of this piece. He ended up winning with a bid of 10 pounds. And so he wasn't duped so much as he was evaluating risk on return. And this is what he did in his oil business. This is how he made his fortune. He'd buy oil leases, he'd take a risk, but the return could be great. In this case, the return was poor, the piece was modern. But he wasn't fooled so much, as I said, taking, taking a, a risk. 
Other cases of forgery don't really have to do with the objects, but have to do with the circumstances of discovery. Uh, this is a news photograph from about 10 years ago where Vladimir Putin, who, you know, likes to wrestle tigers and ride bareback on horses, he went diving uh, off the coast of the Black Sea in the Crimea. And lo and behold, he came up with ancient amphrae, you know, Putin, the, the archaeologist on top of everything else, and he's proudly showing these amphrae. Well, it turns out he didn't just discover these amphorae. These amphorae were placed where he was diving before he went to dive. So the excavation, as it were, was salted with objects. So even when pieces come from excavation or discovered underwater, those circumstances aren't always reliable. As I said, the pieces themselves aren't forgery, but the history they're used to construct, the image of Putin, they, they were used to construct is, is a false one. One of the fields that has interested me a lot lately because it was so valuable to the ancients and to Renaissance and post-Renaissance collectors, less so today, indeed because of forgeries, are ancient engraved gems. These are carved of hard stones like amethyst or cornelian or jasper or rock crystal. They're, they're, they're quite minute, but exquisitely carved. They were expensive because the stones came from exotic locales. They were carved from great carvers. They're again discussed by the ancient writers and quite a lot of them survive. These are two engravings from a book published in 1724 about gems whose, which are carved with signatures of the artists. And some of these artists were highly praised by the ancient writers, in particular, the gem carvers that served Alexander the Great and the Emperor Augustus, whose names are known to us, uh, Pergotheles and Dioscorides. And if you, your screens are big enough, you can see circled in red, the alleged signatures of these two carvers. Uh, we have nothing by Pergotheles that survives. Uh, we have gems by Dioscorides, but these two examples seem to be inventions uh, to serve the market, inventions of probably the 18th century. Uh, in the 19th century, there was a lot of gem forgery, and this gem in our collection has the signature of Dioscorides, uh, the gem carver of Augustus, but it's not carved by him. The style is very florid, the flowing drapery, the narrative scene, the format. This is one of many, many gems uh, made by and for uh, a Polish count resident in Rome, Count Poniatowski, who basically created a huge collection of modern gems with the signatures of ancient carvers, and he caused the market for engraved gems to bottom out. Very different is a gem known from the early 1600s that the Getty recently acquired that actually bears the signature too of Dioscorides, but is carved in the right style with the right techniques in the right shape. Uh, this gem uh, by uh, Dioscorides is now one of the masterpieces in, in our collection. There aren't scientific tests to date the age of stone, and we'll come back to that in a minute. This is done on the basis of style, technique, material, shape, uh, and the history of the piece. The piece was known uh, before there was a rage for gems signed by ancient artists. So again, there wasn't a market for this kind of thing the same way there came to be later. Uh, and here is a bust of Demosthenes, uh, the ancient Greek orator who was pictured. So in a sense, this bronze bust and our gem are copies of an earlier image of the orator Demosthenes, but they're, they're not forgeries. That's the difference between, one of the difference between a copy and a forgery. Uh, different is the gem on the left, um, which is a portrait of Mark Anthony in Amethyst, which has behind the head the signature of a carver, Gnaios. The gem on the right in the British Museum is a Heracles, also signed by Gnaios. Our Gnaios was long thought to be a genuine work by the artist, um, and, but recent research has shown that it seems to have been a pendant to another work by the artist, this one formerly in an Italian collection, now in the Metropolitan Museum, a 
a Hellenistic queen at the time thought to be Cleopatra. So it seems to match a Cleopatra, an Antony was carved by the same carver of our uh, false Dioscorides, Giuseppe Calandrelli. And we know this, fortunately, not because the style is different, and I'll come back to that, but Calandrelli was lucky because he used the right materials, the right shape, chose an artist of the right time. Gnaios, we know, was active uh, at the end of the first century BC, the early first century AD, so just after the time of Mark Anthony. So it's, it's plausible that he could have carved a Mark Anthony. But fortunately, we have in Berlin um, the catalog in Italian that Calandrelli wrote of the works which he himself made in ge of gems in the ancient style. And if you look, I don't know if my cursor shows, but in here uh, is actually named the Mark Antony uh, carved in amethyst with the name of Gnaios on it. There you see Gnaios here, it's uh, Imperatore Marco Antonio. So we have an inventory by the forger of his work. So that's really a nice smoking gun. And then if we go back and look at our Mark Anthony and the two gems by Gnaios, now in the British Museum and the Metropolitan Museum, suddenly we can see differences. The two gems by Gnaios on the right have very highly idealized, very taut skin, no subcutaneous muscles, a great interest in the softness of the hair, and there are other features I could mention, whereas the Mark Antony has a lot of interest in musculature, in softness of the skin, and the hair is more schematic. These two really, these three gems, the two on the right, very clearly, they, the male and female almost share the same profile, are carved by the same hand. The Getty gem seems to be carved by a different hand, and we can reconstruct the context to create a pendant Mark Antony for Cleopatra. It's, it's a beautiful love story. Uh, I wanna close uh, in the few minutes we have left with one of our most famous objects, the Kouros, uh, which there's still some doubt about, although I tend not to like this piece and it's been removed from show, our Kouros, which maybe dates to the sixth century BC, maybe dates to the modern period. Uh, Kouros is a standing uh, youth in, in, in marble or, or bronze or some other material made in the sixth century. This piece is very strange in that it has a, an, odd, an odd surface, this sort of yellow surface. It's also very strange because it has features that seem to relate to different time periods. The head uh, and the hair is, is more archaic. The muscles of the body and especially the feet are later. Uh, it seems that experts disagree and not surprisingly, each expert privileges his or her own field of expertise. So experts on hair say the hairstyle's good, it must be genuine. Experts on knees say, oh, the knees aren't so, so good, it must be fake, and back and forth and back and forth like this. In this slide, you see the Getty Kouros on the left next to a Kouros from Anavisos in Greece, looking quite similar. You see the hair of the Getty Kouros looking similar to a Kouros in New York. You see the feet of the Getty Kouros looking very similar to the feet of a Kouros in Athens. The problem is by our standard chronologies, the New York Kouros was carved at the beginning of the sixth century. The Getty, the um, Toyon Kouros in Athens at the end of the sixth century. Was the Getty Kouros carved by a very long lived sculptor over the course of his career, beginning at the head and then updating his style as he got to the bottom? I think that's unlikely. Uh, many of us now, as I say, don't believe in the authenticity of the Getty Kouros and it's been taken off display, but absolute proof we still don't have. And there are scientific arguments also for and against that are inconclusive. Uh, but forgeries can also generate new ideas and new art. And uh, in the early 2000s, the Getty commissioned a group of Los Angeles artists to riff, as it were, on works on the collection. And the artist Martin Kersels in 2000 um, did a series called The Kouros on Me. Uh, he uh, is, is a large man and he was interested in 
uh, ideal body types and the Kuros, all the Kuroi are ideal body types. They served as tombstones, as dedications of the gods, even as portraits, although they were very schematic. And so Kersels created a series of photographs and, and uh, videos about the Kuros and him, including going up and down on a trampoline to try to, again, interrogate, you know, what is an idea body? What is a work of art? So here, although the Kuros may not be genuine, it nonetheless has inspired other forms of art. I, I close with another form of inspiration, not so much of uh, forgeries, but of replicas and copies. Uh, the R&B singer Norwood Young decorated his house in Bel Air with multiple copies, not only of Michelangelo's David, as you see in the detail, but of the Venus de Milo and other statues, not purporting to own the originals, but certainly surrounding himself in the aura of greatness of these masterpieces. And now having gone a minute over time, I close with this lovely cartoon from the New Yorker about uh, fakes, fakes, every one of them, all total fakes, but I love them all. And, and this is the idea, and this is a, something that philosophers have asked. The works of art in museums that get praised and treasured for years and years, suddenly we, uh, we learn they weren't painted by Rubens or, or Michelangelo or, or Rembrandt. We send them then to the basement. But the work hasn't changed, only our perception of it has. And, and this is really a philosophical question. What are we valuing in work? Are we valuing the skill of the workman, of, of the artisan? Sometimes forgeries are better. Bad work is in no way evidence of forgery. There's good authentic work and there's good forgery. There's bad authentic work and there's bad forgery. So I'll leave you just with one maxim. Quality is no uh, proof of authenticity. And with that, uh, I think it's time to open it up to questions. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Ken, very much. Um, you ended on a topic that leads right into the first question, which is um, about how we do place such enormous weight on works by specific masters in particular, aside from quality. Um, and w was this equally true in the past as with Dioscurides, or do we think that this is more our fixation than one in the in the ancient world? That's a great question. And we know from ancient writers that there were celebrity artists in antiquity. Not so many, although a few in their own lifetimes, but certainly after their death. So I can give you names like Polyclitus, Phidias, Lysippus, Praxiteles, Zeuxis, Apelles, who were famous artists who, whose works after their deaths commanded very, very high prices by later collectors and connoisseurs. So in the Hellenistic period, say from 300 BC down, uh, there were art collectors, there was an art market, there were high prices, and we know there were forgeries to meet that. Uh, there were also a, a few celebrity artists, painters and, and sculptors in their own lifetimes who could command high prices. But these are really exceptional, even like today, you know, your, uh, your, 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 your Jeff Kuhnses or your Gerhard Richters, and I'm not making qualitative justice, judgments over who's good or who's bad, <laughs> but living artists who, who command great prices, whereas most artists are struggling to get by. And the same is true in antiquity. Most of the things in our museums were made not as works of art, but as grave ornaments, as, as, as dining vessels, as wall decoration for the houses. But we know there were collectors and there were famous works. So kind of both. We have a question about whether there are known ancient laws against forgery and, and whether there were punishments and what would those be if you were a forger? That, that's a really good question. Um, the law that immediately comes to my mind is that in the, uh, the sixth century BC, the Athenian lawgiver Solon prohibited gem engravers from making replicas of their designs. And that I think is less again to do with art forgery, 
then the fact that gems, the engraved seal stones that was maybe on your ring is something you'd use as a stamp of identity. You could seal letters and documents. And so if gem engravers had copies of gems, they could forge the signatures as it were of their clients and, and do that. But I think, you know, even today the art market is more and more regulated, but is perhaps not as regulated as, as it might be. And um, I don't know of specific laws against art forgery. There's also the forgery of documents. There are the forgery, there's the forgery of text. There are other kinds of, of, of forgery. But um, it's, it's a good question and something I should dig into more, but I don't know of specific laws prohibiting this. We have a lot of texts, um, for example, of the Roman satirist Marshall, who talks about people being duped by masterworks but that's just their fault because that they choose to buy them. And this is something even in modern forgery, dealers will often not say, this is a work by Michelangelo. They'll say, here's a fine work in the style of the early 16th century. And the buyer might say, and the buyer who's desirous of a Michelangelo says, well, it looks to me like a Michelangelo. And the dealer says, well, oh, well, you have a very good eye, sir. So they're not, you know, saying it's a Michelangelo, but they're leading buyers on, right? Um, we never said it was a Michelangelo. We just said it was in the style of the 16th century. You know, so buyer beware, caveat emptor, this ancient um, phrase applies here. But I don't know of specific legislation about forgery, but it's, it's something I haven't done a lot of research into. Um, Ken, that brings up another question about how paintings from workshops of an original master, um, like say Da Vinci and people in, in the sort of workshop of, how do those people, aside from our judgments, if you're not the master, but how do they fit into all of this? Are they they want the ones accidentally providing forgeries? I threw that in. That well, wasn't the question. Again, I you know there there's there's another cartoon that I love that I didn't show you that has folks in a museum with the audio guide looking at a painting and what they're hearing on the audio guide is something like long thought to be a masterpiece by the painter Michele, you know, uh, the Angelo. Uh, it's now largely thought that the museum really got taken on this one. And, you know, there's a difference between someone like Rubens or, or Rembrandt that had a workshop and had an atelier and they were providing designs, but assistants were, were signing things. We place great value on the hand of the master, uh, but you know the master had a whole organization. You know, to this day, a lot of uh, named artists have assistants that do the actual work. They're mm -hmm. conceiving of the works. But when we go back and look at Renaissance paintings, we say, ah, well, this isn't actually painted by Leonardo. It's a studio or a workshop copy that doesn't make it a forgery per se now it is becomes a forgery if a dealer says ah this is a unique work by the master and charges you 50 million dollars for it uh so but it wasn't made as a forgery before photography um if someone wanted a replica of something if if i liked your painting of saint francis i could say make me one like that and maybe change this or that detail that's not a forgery, that's competitive emulation. <laughs> um, there are a couple of questions that relate to assessing um, forgeries or, or objects. So, for example, um, how do you assess the authenticity or quality is one question of an object when there's no serious fear of it being a forgery? And then does it come up? Um, how does this work? Well, first of all, as I said at the end of the talk, authenticity and quality are two totally different things. Um, there's, there's, and, and in many cases in the Renaissance, when Roman portraits were all the rage, and I, I like to think that forgeries are a very good index of taste. So in the Renaissance, people really wanted Roman portraits. Uh, in the 18th century, people wanted gems and Tanagra figurines. In the early 20th century, people wanted Minoan and Mycenaean works. In the later 20th century, people wanted Cycladic works. Forgeries were made in each of those periods of each of those things, 
but not of those other things in those periods because no one wanted them. So they're very much indices of taste. So in the Renaissance, the fake Roman portraits are often carved fully in the round with details of the hair done excruciatingly in the back. Whereas Romans didn't do that because they carved things for a niche. They were very pragmatic. They weren't going to put in extra work. So quality is, and, and the gem, the Mark Antony that I showed you by Colin Vitelli, it's an exquisite piece of carving. It's fantastic. That's one of the reasons people thought it to be ancient, but quality, good or bad, is not an index of authenticity. Now, so if you have an object, um, you're suspicious of or you're not suspicious of, you have to bring to bear a whole series of, uh, of criteria. Are the materials and shape right for the time? Is the imagery right? Are the technical features? You know, if it was a marble carved using power tools, then obviously it's not going to be ancient. Uh, we can't scientifically date stone or metal, but if it's, it's wood, uh, we can do carbon-14 testing. Now, of course, if it's wood and it the wood tests to be ancient, that doesn't mean the carving of the wood is ancient because forgers could find ancient pieces of wood or ancient pieces of ivory and re-carve them. So proving forgery is not always easy, but sometimes you can have the smoking gun. If you do the carbon-14 tests on a wood panel that's meant to be from from ancient Rome or from Renaissance Italy, and it comes up saying it's from the 19th century, then you know the piece isn't ancient. But if you do that test and it tells you the wood is ancient or Renaissance, it doesn't mean the painting or the carving is. Proving authenticity, philosophers will say, is, is impossible unless you have you know, photographs of the thing on the easel in the carver's workshop. Of course, photograph on the thing, the forger's workshop photograph on the thing of the on the easel in the forger's workshop is also a pretty good proof of forgery and there have been cases like michelangelo of the forger revealing him or herself often out of pride or some other motivation uh, that can help prove a forgery but each case has to be taken uh, on its merits with this battery of different kinds of criteria to come up with a convincing argument for or against um, Ken, can you talk a little bit about the value of um, putting probable forgeries on display or even collecting forgeries on purpose? And obviously our own Koros comes to mind because it was on display for sort of teaching purposes for a long time. Right. Uh, th there, there are two very closely related questions. I'll take the second. Collecting forgeries that are known forgeries on purpose is great to have kind of a, um, a reference collection, uh, you know, for, 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 for teaching, for study. Um, when I think in my own work on forgeries, when, you, when I've been faced with a piece that I'm not sure of, is it or isn't it? It's in the middle. Um, by collecting all the genuine pieces that I'm convinced are genuine because of their, their long histories or their excavation history, that there's not a doubt, I put them in one group and then if there are forgeries that are known forgeries that are obvious forgeries i put them alongside and then i look at the piece and say what does it have in common with the one group and what does it have in common with the other group if we take all the forgeries and burn them destroy them bury them lock them up and they're not available then that reference set disappears right mm -hmm. so that's one of the great values of having the reference set for the scholar and also for the training of students. Putting them on display like our Kouros was similarly, um, I think, a form of transparency, admitting we're not sure. Uh, and when we displayed the Kouros with that label 530 BC or modern forgery, uh, we also had a lot of ancillary information that I went through only a fraction of very quickly in the PowerPoint so people could make a judgment themselves you know are is the surface right or wrong are the abs right or wrong is the oval plinth is the hair right or wrong and although uh i was happy to see the kuros go off show because i don't like it i don't believe it's ancient but i haven't been able to prove it with the smoking gun but it took up a lot of real estate in the museum 
I know a lot of our colleagues are, um, as educators, we're sorry to see it go because it made a great exercise for their students in, in the galleries to discuss problems of authenticity. What are the criteria? One of the problems with the Kuros, with the Kuros as I've said, is that different scholars use the same elements for arguments for or against. One will say it has an oval plinth that must be genuine because there are these other statues with oval plinths. Another scholar will say, well, there are a few other statues with oval plinths, but they're very rare. And as it's oval plinth, that's likely that it's a forgery. To me, that means the oval plinth isn't a reliable diagnostic criterion for or against, and we've got to move on to something else. There are a couple of uh, sort of personal opinion questions that uh, then I'm going to lob your way, knowing that they may not be answerable by you, but I'm interested in your in your possible answers. <laughs> um, so one of them is, and this is really outside the realm of what you were talking about, but I do want to hear what you want to say. Uh, do you think the bust of Nefertiti is real? Yes. Okay, well, now elaborate for a minute. <laughs> well, the truth of the matter is I haven't made a deep study of the bust of Nefertiti. You know, I, I, I was able to see it when I went to Berlin. We all know the photographs, uh, but we're also, you know, aware of uh, the history that in the time that it was found, uh, European countries who were financing uh, excavations in in less developed countries like Egypt would split the fines with the host country. And as I understand it, you know, the works are divvied up and then someone chooses pile A or pile B. And, um, you know, Nefertiti allegedly was hidden in, in pile A with some not very nice things. And then pile B had mostly not very nice things, but some bright and shiny things. And so there was a kind of bait and switch, right? And, and of course, forgeries do have circumstances around them falsified, but um, I, I, I haven't seen convincing arguments, but again, it's, it's, I'm, it's made the questioner might know things that I don't know that suggest it, it is a fake, but it seems to me there's really nothing wrong with it as a sculptor's model. And it's much more valuable to us than it ever would have been in ancient Egypt because it's just a piece of plaster. It's not out of a, a, pre, you know, a bronze or silver or gold or out of a, a hard granite, these valuable things. It's a sculptor's model and it's consistent with the finds from that site as far as I know. Again, and, and Nefertiti has really become a really, really famous person because of the bust. So if we think of the the market conditions that give rise to forgeries usually have to do with authentic things like gems, like Tanagra figurines, like Roman portrait busts, that then the market demand outstrips supply. So forgers step in to fulfill that supply because they're really mostly in it for the money. There was no demand for Nefertiti busts. Why would a forger early in the 20th century have created that, not knowing the demand, and then who got the money? No one, right? Because it was part of this partage system. So for those reasons, I, who am not totally up to date on the Nefertiti bust, think the arguments for forgery uh, are, are, I would say, are very weak. But I could be convinced if there's evidence I don't know of. Uh, I appreciate that answer. That was very thorough. Um, there's one more opinion question that is le demands less knowledge of the um, ancient context of the finds, and it's what you think of the of a Renaissance Romulus and Remus with an Etruscan she wolf. I guess the oh, mix and yeah. match. Is the Does that bother you? Well, this is part of the long history of of the object, and and it doesn't bother me at all. I, I think it, it shows how, you know, as with genuine works, so with forgeries, you know, that each generation and each culture kind of invents the past it wants and needs. And they do that with genuine objects, but they also, but forgers do that as well. And just as I talked about, you know, different people in different periods favoring different things, 
um, you know, the, the, the she-wolf of Rome, uh, which has long been thought to be an ancient Etruscan statue, recently it's been suggested is a medieval statue, which is a very intriguing thing, not a forgery, but a, a, a medieval work, was then in the Baroque period, you know, turned into the symbol of Rome by given, giving the babies, which we know existed in some sculptures in antiquity because we have the image in wall painting and coins and small scale finds. So this is kind of like a, uh, a, a Baroque, a Renaissance Baroque adaptation, emulation, recreation of a work. Not, 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 not a forgery, only a forgery if somebody starts suggesting that the babies are ancient. And, and I don't think anybody about, does. <laughs> there is a question about, um, it's sort of a most forged type of thing question, but will, will people forge almost anything? Um, or yes. is, is, fine, is fine art the most copied because of the money factor, even if you mentioned many other factors? Well, numbers are hard. You know, mm. what, what is the most? You need to do statistical counts. And there are crazy estimates of the number of forgeries on display in our museums. A paradox is we only know the unsuccessful forgeries, those that we've recognized and determined. Then we have those we suspect. And then there's the stuff that we don't suspect at all that we think is genuine, but, but who knows? But there, you know, there, there's forgeries today of you know, designer brands, Yves Saint Laurent bags and Gucci scarves. There's forgeries, unfortunately, of pharmaceuticals. Uh, there's for you know, there's fake news. So you know, fine art forgeries maybe uh, are, are are not at all uh, the, the the number one um, field given you know our, in our world where we have to be on guard. You know, for anything we want to buy online, are are we getting a forgery? I had an experience recently uh, walking on the beach here nearby. Uh, where there was a dog playing with what seemed to be one of those red plastic soft you know bouncy balls but it was it was hard plastic and i had a conversation with the dog's owner he said it was the worst thing he ever bought on online because it looks like it's a bouncy ball and it even has the patterns and the striations in it but it's just molded from hard plastic it's a fake rubber bouncy ball being sold on the internet <laughs> for a fraction of the price in pl hard plastic for a fraction of the price of a rubber ball. So forgeries exist at all levels. And you'd think, is it worth somebody's um, time and effort to make them? And the answer is yet, yes. And certainly if you're forging at the high end, a painting by Leonardo that's going to sell for $125 million, there's gonna be a lot more scrutiny today and the chances are better that you'll fail because the forger will be called out than if you're forging bouncy balls. And even if you do, the buyer's likely to say, oh, damn it, well, whatever, I've got it. I'm not gonna worry about it because it was only a few bucks. But yet, cumulatively, that works for the forger. We have a few more questions and then we're going to ease out of this talk. Um, someone commented about rehabilitated forgeries and we have rebuilt, yes. rehabilitated some. Um, could, you, could you share? any ideas yeah about that? that that's a category I, I should have added but you know I tried to keep this this short um, uh, there are a number of pieces uh, known various periods that have been uh, denounced as forgeries even taken off show and then subsequent research has demonstrated that they are in fact ancient and and in these cases the most compelling criteria are either technical, uh, where something has been misunderstood. A famous case is a bronze horse in the Metropolitan Museum that was long a favorite uh, sculpture of the Mets. And then one day, um, a, a, a Met scholar who had done some work on other forgeries, and I can admit, once you get bitten by the forgery bug, you start seeing them or suspecting them everywhere. <laughs> he noticed what seemed to be a seam along the back of this bronze horse. And he thought that this was evidence of a kind of two mold sand casting that wasn't the way the ancient Greeks and Romans produced their bronzes. Other cultures produced bronzes this way. So he thought it was a forgery and the piece was denounced and it was taken off show. 
And after a lot of technical examination, which happens very gingerly, one of the conservators realized that this seam wasn't part of the statue at all, and was actually something that had been left on the statue, when indeed they made molds for the statue to make replicas in the gift shop. And so, you know, these technical examination, this technical feature, which was suspicious, turned out to be not part of the piece at all, and the piece has been rehabilitated. There are other instances where things look so bizarre that it was thought they must be forgeries, and then subsequent excavation at other sites has revealed parallels for them that weren't, couldn't possibly have been known to the forger, couldn't have served as the forger's models, and tend to support the authenticity of the piece. Those are two examples of rehabilitated forgeries, and, and, and th there, there are several others. Um, but that's yet another category. Thank you. You might have to do a whole separate talk on rehabilitation of forgeries. So I'm going to end with a question that involves what your most, uh, what your opinion is about the most scandalous forgery, if you have one, or or anything that is your favorite forgery, possibly if that doesn't work. Well, I, I've I've hit upon a, a, a few of them in, in, in this talk. The gems, the the kouros is is an interesting case. I think I'll refer to something I didn't talk about because it's not antiquity. It's the case of, um, of Han van Mirgen, who was the subject of a recent film, a fictionalized, the, the, the Last Vermeer. And this is a, a Dutch painter who, uh, between the wars, and this is typical of many other forgery stories, was unable uh, to launch a successful career. And he became very bitter that works his own original works in his own style didn't catch on. And so he started painting works in the style of old masters, including Vermeer. And he actually aimed his paintings at one of the art critics who had rejected his own work, trying to create works from a missing period in Vermeer's career that the scholar had speculated about. So when Van Meergen's Vermeers appeared, they again fulfilled expectations. Of course it's genuine because it meets my theory about Vermeer. Uh, Van Meergen then became very rich and successful kind of as a dealer. And he actually sold one of his fake Vermeers to uh, Hermann Goring, uh, Hitler's right-hand man. And then after the war, he was accused of selling the Dutch national patrimony to the Nazis. And he was put on trial as a Nazi collaborator. So on trial, he had to say, no, no, I didn't sell Vermeer to the Nazis. I, I faked Vermeer and I duped Goring and I was being a good Dutchman and duping the Nazis. And no one believed him because the work was, they thought so good, it had to be by Vermeer. So he had to demonstrate in court by painting another fake Vermeer to show that he could actually do the forgery, right? So, so that's that's one of my favorite stories. It's not it's not an ancient forgery, but there are other cases where experts buy in to fake work, and then they're unwilling to believe that they couldn't be be ancient, and and the forger has to prove uh, Van Meergen to retain his freedom, Michelangelo for his own pride. There's there's this. Um, this line of uh, inquiry. That's a great story. Um, and this is the perfect way to end. Ken, thank you so much. This was really entertaining and illuminating. Thank you everybody for coming and for all the good questions. And please join us for some more True Crime in Ancient Times talks this week and come to the Getty Villa when you can and see things in the original and hope to see you here and online soon. Thanks, Ken. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye.